Well, hello, and welcome to the Reading for Pleasure, the Nectar of Imagination webinar, brought to you by the Reading Agency and the Open University. I'm Hayley Butler, Head of Marketing and Communications for the Reading Agency, and I'll be chairing tonight's event. At the Reading Agency, we work every day towards a world where everyone is reading their way to a better life. Last year, we worked with 1.8 million people across the nation. We believe that reading can tackle life's big challenges, from social mobility to mental health. And we're determined that no one is left behind as we strive towards realizing this vision. At The Open University, the team with a strong social justice focus share their research into reading for pleasure and work with practitioners to nurture the reading habit in the young. They support over 100 OU UK literacy association teachers reading groups nationally and work with 30 initial teacher education providers to support student teachers as readers, as well as offering year-long CPD programmes in order to build rich reading cultures in schools. The Reading Agency and the Open University have partnered on the new Teachers Reading Challenge, a free challenge website developed for teachers, teaching staff and school librarians to expand and deepen knowledge of children's literature and reading for pleasure. You can join the challenge up until the 31st of October at teachersreadingchallenge.org.uk and I'm sure we will hear more about the challenge later. Tonight our expert panel are Professor Teresa Kremen, Matthew Courtney, Sonia Thompson and jo Joseph Quello. They'll be sharing research and practical advice, exploring how developing children's pleasure in reading enriches children's life chances and how you can apply reading for pleasure principles in your classroom, school library and at home. Once we've heard from each of the panel, I'll be asking questions that have been sent in from our audience. So thank you in advance if you did send in a question. And last but not least, Joe will be performing a live reading at the end of the webinar. We will also be uploading the recording of the webinar to our YouTube channels and you will receive the link via email later this week along with a feedback survey to find out what your thoughts were of the webinar to help us develop future events. So let's dive in. To kick us off, let's introduce Professor Teresa Kremen. So Teresa is a Professor of Literacy and Education at The Open University. Her work involves research, teaching and consultancy. Teresa is a reading expert on the DfE English Hub Council, chairs the Council's Reading for Pleasure subcommittee and leads the Open University's work to foster a love of reading. So Teresa, the big question, why is it children should read for pleasure and what can their teachers do to help? Thank you, Hayley. Uh, it is a big question, but being a, a frequent reader, one of the children who chooses to read is just frankly fundamental. It's more of an advantage than a well-educated parent. Those children who choose to read in childhood and who read frequently accrue multiple benefits. Uh, and there's, there's strong research evidence that shows there's a cognitive advance in adolescence if you are a childhood reader. Not a child who can read, but a child who does read and who reads avidly. And we know that both teachers and academics are, are in agreement on this issue. Uh, drawing on countless years of experience we see in front of us and 255, 300 colleagues who are attending tonight. Years of experience of teaching teach us as educators things and years of experience of researchers also teach. And those drawing together show really clearly that the kind of collective wisdom of both show there are big advantages if you're a reader, advantages that relate to enriching vocabulary, uh, wider general knowledge of the world and curiosity and an enhanced comprehension, both an oral comprehension and a written one. And that's really salient for our young people because the will to read, the desire to read influences the skill. That's why it's a social justice issue, because developing the habit of reading in childhood is one of the most important things that we can do to leverage social change, just as the Reading Agency and the OU are trying to, to work on. And of course, it's not just, is it, cognitive benefits. There are social, emotional benefits too, relational benefits when we read, when we find reading reassures us, wraps us in a scarf of comfort, reading delights us, makes us laugh, makes us curious. Uh, it helps us in times of adversity. So it's not just the cognitive, but the social and emotional that enrich our lives. And related to tonight's title, Imagination, 
Reading feeds our imaginations. It gives us new places to go, new people to connect to. It allows us to connect to ourselves as well as other people. And that kind of imaginative connection drives our reading. So there's that strong sense of, for all of us as readers, as adult readers, as well as children, we make life to text and text to life moves. We move between the text and our lives and then back to the text, going both ways. And those connections are critical. Think of, um, I don't know, reading a, boy, a story about the boy in the back of a class, for example. As we're reading it, we're also making intertextual connections, connections between this story and the story of other children I know who've moved house, or my friend who's had to move flats because their parents are separated. All kinds of displacement, large as well as small, are the connections we're making to our lives and to others' lives to read the text. And what's happening in that kind of process is that affect is right at the heart of it, feeling, emotion. And that emotion drives our desire to persist when the going gets tough, our desire to keep going, to keep turning the page. So for all of us as, as adults and child readers, the imagination is right there at the centre of it, affectively driving. So the second part of your question is, well, what can teachers do about it? They want to have this for young people. Uh, well, clearly for my um, money, as the expression goes, but for my mind, one of the things that teachers can do uh, is, and, and absolutely central, is be readers. Be readers who know their children, their children themselves well as readers readers but they know their literature, they know their non-fiction, they know their graphic novels and then they can make a connection one with the other and foster reader development. But another strand of teachers knowledge needs to be knowledge of pedagogy. How do we turn that into action? How do we get, as we've argued in the OU's research, four strands of an RFP pedagogy. Reading aloud, that kind of connecting reading aloud, not reading aloud for comprehension, that's a different kind of reading aloud, nothing wrong with it, essential, but that's not reading aloud for pleasure. And then book talk, blether, chat, you know, reader to reader, time to read, time to read what I want to read, not what you want me to read because it's good for me, but what I chose to read because I'm fascinated by it and enjoying it. And then in that kind of, those four encapsulated in a social reading environment. But, but more than the uh, pedagogy and the knowledge, we need readers around us. We need a reading community. We need teaching assistants, readers, teachers themselves, obviously, admin staff, and critically, we need reading head teachers. Reading head teachers who lead their school with reading for pleasure at the heart of it. And so you ask me what we can do. We need to develop more readers in our country, more readers who are actively reading children's literature as well as the uh, literature of adults, as it were, so they can support young people and build communities of readers who choose to read. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, Teresa. That's fantastic. Brilliant answer. And I agree, you know, reading for pleasure really does, it feeds our imagination. I love that term and it satisfies our curiosity and it really does help us connect. So thank you. So Sonia Thompson is, as Teresa describes, a reading head teacher. So Sonia, you're a head teacher at St. Matthew's in Nationals in Birmingham. Um, you're also an OU UKLA teacher reading group leader and UKLA NC member. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Why do you think that this RFP knowledge is key? And how do you ensure your staff develop it and that you, they use that knowledge to enrich children's reading for pleasure? So that's a big question. I know you can answer it. <laughs> Sonia, your mic's off. Sorry, I'm on now. Um, You're on. I think building on what Teresa said, I think you've summed it up beautifully, Teresa. There's so many um, strands um, that you've mentioned that I, I, I'd like to follow up on. I think where we talk about um, reading head teachers, I, I really, really would like to advocate um, this idea that the, le the leadership of the school um, are immersed in reading themselves. Um, and that becomes part of the culture of the school. I think if, if a school is built around a culture of reading, then it will um, find its way into policies, it will find its way onto um, uh, documentation that says that we've got to invest um, time um, and energy and um, training in um, ensuring that we are a school that reads for pleasure. I think often you will find te there, there's individual teachers who move this agenda forward so powerfully, um, yet when you go into a school, it's not something that everybody does. And I'd certainly like to think that if you came into my school, um, St. Matthew, 
views, you would have a sense that we are a school that reads for pleasure um, and that reading for pleasure is at the heart of what we do. Um, I think it's crucial. Um, Teresa talked about the benefits of reading for pleasure. Um, if nothing else, as, as heads, uh, where we are, have, have an accountability culture, um, this idea that reading for pleasure has an impact on attainment, gosh, if nothing else, then that, that has to be a driver for us, um, never mind all the other positive benefits that reading has. Um, and I think it's imperative on us not to leave it to chance. I think often we leave um, this idea of reading for pleasure to chance um, and we're not taking the time to, um, to allow time for our teachers to be trained properly, um, to read in school, to exchange knowledge about children's literature, to find out about practice. There is a, a, um, a, a feeling that we've got to get everything else done. Um, and one of the things that I, I've certainly developed within my school is the space um, and the time um, for it to be part of our curriculum, part of our culture. And there is no other thing that we should be doing rather than reading for pleasure. It is one of the things that we do. Um, and, I, and for me, without doing it, we, we're not St. Matthews. Um, that is what makes us St. Matthews, a, a school that reads for pleasure. Um, so I think it's imperative that it's put onto things like school improvement plans, which is what we, we've done um, for about five years now. Never take it off, I say. Um, always <laughs> make it school improvement so that your governors then have to fund it. And, and, and find out about it and check up on you and whether or not you're achieving your um, reading for pleasure targets. Um, so really it's got to be driven from the top, I think. Um, and of course, if you've got fabulous practitioners who are enthusiastic and positive and want to move it forward as well, then you're, you're onto a win winning formula. Um, I think the research is clear as well. I think we've really got to, find, if we're such a research driven and um, profession, and um, this is an agenda where the research backs up every um, idea around reading for pleasure, every um, idea in terms of it having its benefits. And I think that is a strength of what we're trying to develop here, something that has a base, something that has um, research, something that has a strong underlying principles around the pedagogy that really, really works. And I think if you are a school that have committed yourself to driving that pedagogy forward, um, the benefits, um, as I said, in every other subject um, are tangible. And certainly um, for St. Matthews, that's what we found, tangible benefits in every curriculum area because we are a school that reads for pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you, Sonia. I think it's quite clear that reading teachers create reading children. Um, so really, we all need to lead by, oh, actually, mind the pun, read by example. Thank you. <laughs> so welcome Matthew. Matthew Courtney is a primary school teacher and reading lead at Gorsbrook Primary School in London. He's also an OU UKLA teachers reading group leader. So Matthew, how do you keep up to date with children's literature? Um, thanks Hayley. I just wanted to start by kind of reiterating what Teresa mentioned about how it is, it is so important as the OU research suggests for teachers to know their books. I think a particular challenge at the moment is there are so many great books out there and so much great children's literature out there. How does one as a teacher choose what to read next? I mean, it's not a bad problem to have, I guess. Um, some of the ways where the places I go for recommendations are on Twitter because there's such a wealth. There's so many great school librarians, teacher assistant teachers who are reading and recommending books on there. It's a great place to kind of find books, books on there. Another place I go to is I'm a member and a leader of an OU UKLA teachers reading group. And lots of um, members recommend books, but I think the important thing there is as well, they're recommending the books. They're also um, given a kind of professional discussion goes alongside it. So they're linking the books with that reading for pleasure pedagogy. So this particular book sings loud. When you read it aloud, it sings off the page. Or this book's great for book bleb and get a big one on the carpet all to share. So I think it's good to get those recommendations, but also to have that discussion alongside it, which is excellent as well. Something I think is really important, and as teachers we're kind of charged with responsibility to consider when we're choosing books, is diversity and inclusion. And I mean that as a broad term, so thinking about representations of disabled characters, neurodiverse characters, sexualities, genders, etc. But particularly paying consideration to ethnic representation um, in response partly to the CP CLPE's research, um, Reflection Realities research, which showed the disparity between the ethnic representation in children's books and the children in our classrooms and wider society. So I think as teachers, we need to actively be looking for positive 
um, quality representation of different different characters in in other books we're recommending and reading ourselves. So some places I go to find those recommendations that pay consideration to diversity and inclusion. Uh, Books for Keeps is a great online uh, children's magazine in general, but particularly the Beyond the Secret Garden column from Darren Chetty and Karen Sands O'Connor is really useful for kind of critically analysing children's books for representation, but also sometimes there are book lists or recommendations in there, so that's a great place to go to find great quality literature. And also some of the smaller publishers like uh, Tiny Owl and Nights Of that have diversity inclusion, their core and everything they do is a great place. And books, buying books from booksellers like Letterbox Library is another place to look at. Um, in terms of like looking at my own subject knowledge in terms of reading, on the Research Rich Pedagogies website, there's a review your practice document, which has been really useful. We had a go as a staff team and it just gives you a chance to pause and reflect upon the books you know the genres you know really well in terms of children's literature and any kind of gaps in your own knowledge or your own repertoire of known books. And when I was, my, uh, my career has predominantly been in Key Stage 1, so it kind of confirmed what I already knew, that I kind of had a, a strong, fairly strong knowledge of picture fiction. But in terms of longer books, I kind of struggled. I haven't read as many of them, so I had to actively kind of read outside my comfort zone, so to speak, go and actively find those books and those recommendations of longer books aimed at older children to read them. So the space we're in was recommended as part of our teachers' reading group. I still not, I won't say too much, but I'm not quite emotionally recovered from that one yet. Um, another place that I go to to find these books and these kind of genres that I need to develop my own knowledge on has been the Teachers' Reading Challenge, which I found really useful. Particularly on the website, there's a page called the Blether Boards. So people post reviews up and there's a chance to comment and kind of engage in that professional dialogue I mentioned before. And again, from the review your practice document, I found I had a gap in knowledge of graphic novels. So again, it's another area I'm trying to find those books and read them. And a book that I've just started, I got I recommended from the Teachers Reading Challenge, is El Defo by C.C. Bell. I only just started it, but a really great start and heard really great things again on the Blether Board. So that's a really useful way to kind of get those recommendations. It's something I really wish I had when I was trained to be a teacher because it really would have helped have that secure knowledge before I started in my teaching uh, career. Um, something else on the Teachers Reading Challenge is the poster. So we're, gonna, we're hoping to print them off in school because there's places for the teachers to write down the books they've read as part of the Teachers Reading Challenge. We hope it will position, further position us as teacher, readers, uh, teachers that read and give a chance to engage in that professional dialogue with other teachers or other staff members, also children. So everyone's seen us as readers and kind of a chance to blether about the books that we've read. So really enjoying being part of that. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. And um, great that you're using the poster as well. I think that's really important that we wanted to create um, on the profile page. Um, so when you join um, the challenge and you sign in, you um, enter your profile page and your personal dashboard. And there you can find your not only your poster, but also your reading diary. Um, and both both the poster and the diary are able to download. You can use it on your computer. You can print it off um, and really wanted to create some um, with a diary and the ability to be able to keep something in your portfolio when we know some people would prefer to have something to write in rather than kind of you know have it online um, but with the poster it's exactly that Matthew so the way that you know you're describing using it is exactly how we wanted it to be used it was about teachers being able to have their class support them set the goals with them um, you know share their to the children to share their love of the books that they've been reading so that they would inspire the teachers but also so that the children would see the teachers reading and then hopefully that would prompt them to join, say, for example, the, um, the reading agency's winter mini challenge, which starts in December or the summer reading challenge, which will start again next year. And then together they can go on a reading journey, which was really important for us. So I'm so pleased to hear that you're using it. OK, so on to Joseph. So Joseph Quello is a multi award winning children's author and poet. His debut children's collection, Werewolf Club Rules, was the winner of the CLPE Clipper Poetry Award. His collection, Overheard in a Tower Block, went on to numerous long and short listings for various awards, including the Carnegie Medal. His picture book, If All the World Were, illustrated by Alison Colpoise, won the Independent Bookshop Week Book Award. So Joe, what will you be reading for us after the Q&A? After the q and I'll be reading from um, my latest first novel, The Girl Who Became a Tree. So I'll be doing a little bit of a rundown of some of the poems from that. Um, and I'll also share a couple of poems from uh, Poems Aloud, which is all about reading poetry out loud and having fun with performance. Yay! Huh. Cheers, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what, Joe? That 
I'm going to get you to start the Q&A then because um, you've, just, you've just helped me out greatly with that link. Um, <laughs> do you have any tips on how to read aloud to keep children engaged? And that's a question that came in um, from the audience. So thank you for that. Oh, brilliant. What a fantastic question. Yeah, I think um, we should really think about the voice as an instrument um, because then that opens up lots of different ways that you can use that instrument. And it's amazing how much mileage you can get from thinking about those different kind of performance techniques. Mm -hmm. So that might be thinking about pace, reading, reading a poem or a story slowly or parts of a story slowly or quickly. You, you can think about volume. So you can do a crescendo where you start quietly and then get louder and louder and louder or a diminuendo where you start loudly and get quieter and quieter and quieter. But you can have so much fun. And I often have a lot of fun with young people in the classroom just exploring these different ways that you can lift words, bring words off the page and out in, into the space. And I, I think it, it makes words come, come alive. It makes them fizz. And I, I think young people especially really respond to that, to seeing words and, and especially their own words, as well as the words of authors and poets, but words that they've written as well can, when they see that they can have that power, it's hugely impactful. I love the fizz. I, I think that's a great, a great explanation. Brilliant. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, so next question. Um, in these challenging COVID times and with school libraries not always being equipped, how do you keep the culture of reading for pleasure going? And how do you keep teachers motivated to practice? So that's another great question by our audience. So thank you very much. Um, Matthew, do you want to start us off with this one? Yeah, I think in a way it kind of presented in terms of earlier lockdown, the phases that we were in, it presented kind of a unique opportunity for time to read books. We sometimes don't in our busy lives. So kind of there was an opportunity there for us to engage and perhaps um, read more books we wouldn't have time to otherwise in terms of our busy lives. I think it's, I think the challenge is looking at those principles that Teresa mentioned earlier and how can we then translate those when we perhaps can't all be together to have a big read aloud session in the hall. How can we keep those same principles of choice of reading aloud, independent reading? How can we provide the opportunities for those in these difficult times? I'm kind of answering your question with a, another question I suppose. I suppose, sorry, Teresa, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in. Um, I suppose uh, for us at St Matthews, we very much use the time that, that Matthew talked about, the lockdown time, to um, engage the teachers in recording um, themselves reading. Um, so there was lots of opportunities uh, for the teachers to share text. We, we also provided opportunities for children to choose the texts that the oh, yeah. teachers to read aloud to them, um, which again um, provided lots of opportunities across the board. Um, I think it, 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 it's imperative that uh, because we, we, it, we have to face the fact that in the time that we're living in, there is the possibility that we may well go back to that type of blended learning. And I think schools need to plan um, for what that the opportunities to read aloud to children, to read books, to continue to reading, to read to children, um, they're going to provide. Um, and I think, it, you know, my, my thing is always plan for it, plan. What are you going to do? I mean, as I said, recording um, teachers reading as well as live reading sessions um, were really powerful for our children. We, we actually wrote um, a paper, one of our teachers, Louise Fa Louisa Farrow, wrote a paper on our research website, St Matthew's Research School website, about um, the impact of us sustaining our reading for pleasure and the impact that it had on our children, not only through the lockdown, but as we came out of the lockdown and back into school. And it was a really powerful, it, it was extremely powerful um, when it's planned for and developed and sustained, um, it, it, it works, it works. Yeah, I can well believe it, Sonia. And the only thing that I would add to that is I know a few schools who, whose teachers in Key Stage 2, Matt, um, chose to read aloud a book without showing their face, without doing the, using the voices, Joe, but not necessarily being the person. Yeah. So reading a Key Stage 2 novel, but taking it in turns. Now that could be happening now. You know, I could read the beginning chapter of uh, The Way We Were, or whatever that lovely book is that made me cry like buckets. And it was here on my pile a bit earlier on, but it's a uh, move. But if I went to, I don't know, let's just go for uh, Brock by uh, Anthony McGowan. I could read chapter one, Matt could read chapter two, 
two next weekend. None of this is being shared with children yet. By the time we've got six weeks down or we go into lockdown in February, then we've got four novels that the children can hear. And they can hear the diff. Oh, that's Sir, or oh, that's Mrs. So and so. She's in, or oh, that's the head teacher, or oh, there's the secretary. She, that's her voice. You know? And then we've got a resource ready to share, or indeed, if a class has to go into lockdown, and that class can then listen in to those stories. Some children are being richly read aloud to at home, some are not, and they get access to those and the connection, the human connection with their teachers and their admin staff and TAs and so on. So I think I absolutely write, Sonia, prepare for it as if. And I think what we also had, what we were um, not surprised by, but just over, overjoyed by, was children filming themselves reading and posting <laughs> themselves reading on our um, online platform so we were able to share um, children reading at home and uh, the behavior the reading behaviors that they exhibited which showed that they were watching their teachers um, when they were reading aloud um, was was so powerful um, seeing the teachers imitate the adults who had read to them um, so again it, it really it really shows um, the influence that teachers have um, when they do read aloud yes I think an un unintended consequence perhaps of that as well is when I was watching some of these reading aloud videos online, just like Josie, you're talking about using your voice and instrument, there were so many things I saw, I was like, I want to try that when I read aloud next. So in terms of my own development, when I'm going to read aloud next, I think for when I first started training and first started teaching, I was really unconfident for doing it. So I think if I saw all these great videos, these people doing it, I might be able to, might be able to borrow some ideas, be a bit more confident when I then went to do it in front of a class. Can I throw in one anti this for a minute, just to be a bit, um, you know, whatever. But there is a danger. There is a real danger that we perform the reading aloud. Now, if you're watching performance poetry, if you're, you know, engaged in a performance, that's one piece. But what am I trying to do with Brock or Welcome to Nowhere? I'm trying to give voice to McGowan and Elizabeth Laird's voice. I'm trying to draw the meaning out of the text. And so I totally support if you're in key stage one and there's a kind of element of performance, but also even then we want the meaning of the text to surface through our voice and through our subtle actions, not the I'm reading this, this book and I'm performing it, watch me. So we lose the text then and we get the actor. And I saw a lot of that on, on Twitter and I thought, oh, what a shame because that text 